So, I wanted to talk a little bit about alibis, uh, victim rights, and kind of the courtroom, like what's current in the Brian Koberger case in the courtroom, like what we're currently waiting on, what's going on, kind of the drama, and um, yeah, just have a conversation about that. Uh, April 17th is when we're going to be hearing finally, officially, what Brian Koberger's alibi is going to be. I'm excited to hear it. I'm looking on. forward to hearing it. Um, and it's, I believe, going to be a public hearing. So we're all going to hear it. That's the deadline uh, judge, judge set. So as long as it's maintained and they go through with it, we're finally going to hear it. And it seems like that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk about the actual Idaho Code 19 dash 519 that talks about what an alibi is in Idaho law. So it says anytime after arraignment before a magistrate upon a complaint and upon a written demand of a prosecuting attorney, the defendant shall serve within 10 days or at such different time as the court may direct. Upon the prosecuting attorney, a written notice of his intention to offer a defense of alibi. Such notice by the defendant shall state the specific place or places at which the defendant claims to have been at the time of the alleged offense and the names and addresses of the witnesses upon whom he intends to rely to establish such an alibi. Hmm. Now, here's an, an interesting part that I didn't know. Now, this is, uh, that was one, this is two, the second part. Within 10 days after the receipt of the defendant's notice of alibi, but in no event less than 10 days before trial, unless the court otherwise directs, the prosecuting attorney shall serve upon the defendant or his attorney a written notice stating the names and addresses of the witnesses upon whom the prosecution intends to rely to establish the defendant's presence at the scene of the alleged offense and any other witnesses to be relied on to rebut but testimony of any of the defendant's alibi witnesses. Meaning, 10 days after Brian Koberger gives his alibi, that will be Bill Thompson's deadline to provide his witnesses that are supposed to prove Brian Koberger was at the scene and any of his witnesses that will rebut Brian Koberger's alibi. So like Dylan Mortensen. Yes. Or any experts like, so that's interesting. So we're getting all, we're getting his alibi and then we're getting Bill Thompson's direct opposition to his alibi. Yeah. Yeah. And all of that should be public. At least I would hope so. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. I heard a couple things that uh, were said in there that um, it really, it, I think so many people put such an emphasis on the fact that he stayed silent, you know, uh, during his guilty, not guilty, haven't submitted his alibi, even though he kind of did submit his alibi. Just nobody is happy with the amount of information that's given. But what's important based off what you just said is that there are specifics that are expected in these things. So if you are really driving around, and I'm not making excuses for Brian Cooper, he could totally be guilty. I'm just looking at it from the point of view that our justice system is trained and told to look at it, right? Uh, innocent until proven guilty. So if, uh, if he says he's driving around, that would be hard to... Proof. Submit, yeah. Without your phone records, without your phone data, without security camera footage, like especially if your phone was turned off or died, like I agree. yeah, it would be extremely hard to prove unless you have all that stuff, which is what Ann Taylor's waiting on. Yeah, yeah. You you know another interesting thing too that this it might take us just a little bit off is uh I was looking into like the weirdness around his alibi just recently. And I was also looking into um, him staying silent and uh, you, you know how they target 
him for staying silent when making standing, his plea yeah, of standing innocence silent. or guilt, right? He didn't make uh, a plea. That's the thing. The, so right. Well, when you don't make a plea, it the is judge put in does it for you. Not guilty. Yeah. Yeah. But so it's not called standing silent. It's actually super common and called standing mute. Mm. When so when I started looking up like standing silent in court, right? All it pulled up was stuff about Brian Coburger. Right. So then I started digging through it. Like, why would you stand silent? Whatever, whatever. Then I read this one little thing that was like, well, attorneys call it standing mute. So then I, I look up standing mute and it pulls up so much, dude. Like, was it's that? not that okay. uncommon. Okay. Okay. Was that intentional? That was my question. Because too. media knows SEO. They yep. know Google search engine optimization. Yeah. They know that. So who made that decision to call it that when it's not actually called that? Yeah. When it's actually called standing mute. Mm -hmm. And did all their guests they had on their show, did they say, hey, call it standing silent, please? Yeah. Yeah. All the attorneys. Yeah. Why? 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 Why did you guys do that? Did you do that on yeah. purpose so that we couldn't pull up what it actually was? And all these websites for like, you know, Lewis and, and Dick Stein, which is attorney, uh, LSD.law, Standing Mute, Oxford, okay. Doc okay. McKee, Standing okay. Mute, like just tons. You guys. And it's totally common. You guys, go do that experiment right now. Go search Standing Silent and then Google search after that Standing Mute and see what the difference is and post it. Reply to us in Twitter and tell us what you got or in the comments of this video. Yeah. Wherever you follow us, tell us what happened when you did that because yeah. I had the same exact experience and that was months ago. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why it, fe it felt weird and I don't know why at that time because I've looked into it too, but I was like, there's no way Brian Koberger is... Oh, how did I get to it? I got to it because I read something talking about the connections to BTK and Brian yep. Koberger. And I was like, I was reading it and I was thinking, I guess it could be weird. I guess, you know, the connection between the uh, the college professor and BTK and Brian Koberger or whatever. But then the, his daughter highlighted the fact that they both stood silent. And I was like, you know how many people we've seen in our judicial system? They cannot be the only two people to do that, especially when there's an expectation of what happens when someone stands Right, I mean, this has happened. Like, you're put in as not guilty. So I was like, okay, well, precedent. who else has done it? Yeah. yeah. So I start digging and digging and digging, and I find out, yeah, it's not actually called standing silent. Okay, and it means you don't acknowledge the charges or the validity of the charges, and it makes the judge then therefore say, not guilty pleading for you yeah. pleading for you not guilty um so yeah i i yep. see i and see are, why it's done and there's multiple reasons to it it's interesting you guys should go look it up i don't want to hijack the topic we're talking about or whatever but no uh, it's the interesting. standing mute is very interesting so can you give us the basics uh the, it it's broken down on a state-by-state -state basis but it gen it it just talks about Back in the early 1900s, um, people stood mute when uh, they didn't want to commit some kind of legal jargon to the precedence of the court. So, like, it was them saying, I don't agree with any of this. I don't want anything to do with any of it, which then, therefore... Uh, was forced into a pretrial and uh, it, the jury had to then look at if there was enough evidence to continue the trial. So it bypassed something back in the early 1900s. I don't remember. I didn't take notes on on that. Okay. But I can find it. Okay. So they, it was basically a way of, I don't have to submit any explanation or plea. And mm -hmm. like, I don't have to commit to anything. Yep. And they need to see if these charges are even valid to continue. Yeah. By a jury. Yeah. Yeah. Like it a grand, was, a was it like, a grand jury? Maybe it was a way to force a jury into looking at the evidence to see if there's enough to go to like a pre or trial, a trial. It From sounds my like a grand. It sounds like it forces it to a grand jury. That kinda. would be interesting <laughs> if standing mute was connected directly to grand, grand jury juries back in the day. Yeah, 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 but they expected a prelim in this case, but didn't get it. They got a grand secret grand jury. Um. 
But yeah, I thought that was uh, interesting going back here um, that we're going to then hear Bill Thompson's rebuttal to his alibi. And I didn't realize that before until reading the actual code. Um, and this, That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, the law is written in a way I see here, like, you know, a po- like for the literally the last one, Section five says for good cause shown, the court may grant an exception to any of the requirements of subsections one through four. Okay, Meaning so like the judge really just gets to choose. Yeah, it's multiple, which, mm-hmm. which makes sense. I, I understand that, too. And to be honest, like if we're looking at this entire Brian Koberger situation, including the prosecution, including the defense, including the judge, everything seems pretty normal around the alibi, even though people have made it a huge deal to the point where I was even like, whoa, what's going on here? Such a big deal. You know, is this normal? Is this not? And honestly, it was like soap opera. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Everything was standard. Yep. To be honest. But I'm interested in hearing the prosecution bring forward their evidence. And that makes me feel a little bit better about Idaho Code that when the defendant has to bring forth his information, in this case his, uh, then the prosecution has to bring forward theirs, which feels fair. Yes, I think it's I think it is fair, especially yeah. since I heard from an attorney and I don't remember who this was, but it was on the news somewhere. It was on some ma- MSM like mainstream media type place that Idaho is one of the only states that has a deadline for an alibi. That that's not normal to have a deadline. You know there's a uh, conspiracy theory out there that I think I told you this, actually. I think I said it on the True Crime Talk Show about Idaho not existing. No. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I was talking about it before uh, you had got on camera or something, but there's a big old conspiracy theory out, like Tin Hat conspiracy theory out there that Idaho doesn't really exist. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, that it it's exists just the Twilight Zone, and like they use it to push stories but you'll never actually meet anyone from idaho and idaho claims that only people from other states come to idaho but there is no idaho oh gosh (laughs) yeah it's super funny so anyway that's a little cray cray but um getting into what an alibi defense is because we've heard you know many people mention in this case that they believe that's ann taylor's strategy is an alibi defense uh, what exactly does that mean? Well, clearly, we know what an alibi is. He's trying to prove he wasn't there and didn't do it. Now, an alibi defense is considered the one of the strongest defense strategies, period. Yeah. Which makes sense because you're trying to prove you weren't there. Now, there's three essential elements to an alibi defense, which is the defendant was not present at the time or the place of the crime, obviously. Two, the defendant had no reasonable opportunity to commit the crime. Mm. And three, the defendant could not have committed the crime by any other means. I don't think it's the third one, but the first two could be. What? What's not the third one? I don't think that the third uh, focus point would benefit Brian Koberger in this case, but I think the first two could. So the defendant was not present at the time or place of the crime. Okay, we're trying to find out what their phone records, what his phone records are, Brian Koberger's phone records are. Um, And that should be able to support that, right? And maybe there's some other things there and we just don't know. The third is essential for an alibi defense because not only are you trying to create enough reasonable doubt in the state's case that he wasn't there, that they don't, they can't prove he was there, basically, that they, he had no opportunity, reasonable opportunity to commit this crime. But also the third nail in the coffin is that there's no other way you could spin this to make it seem like he did this. Well, like there's no other opportunity. So you're all going ahead and thwarting an, uh, an opposition that isn't even being presented yet. Yeah. I, and I do get that. I understand that. Uh, but they're the current character focus or, or crime focus, I guess I should say um, is, uh, is that, He planned this out, but he made a mistake. 
and he it when he was wiping down the knife sheath he didn't get inside the button like that's the storyline that you know it this was really good plan planned out for a long time he knew what he was doing he hated women and like this was it mastermind right right (laughs) so um that third one though it, it makes me feel like that couldn't support this specific situation because like being out driving around, I mean, technically there could be other opportunities to do this crime. Um, but yeah, but you're basically, I don't know. Like I, I, it all makes sense to me. I'm confused why you're hung up on arguing against that. I'm, I'm not, there's always going to be other opportunities is the point. Yeah. They could always twist the evidence in some other way to make it seem like this person could have done. Yeah. No, I, I understand that. I just am think tanking it, trying to figure out what the direction could be, because if you're uh, a defense attorney, you're going to focus on one of those more than another, because your evidence is going to support one of those directions that will then support the, idea of him not being there you don't have to have all of those i mean those are the three essential elements i gotcha i i think that i mean maybe the third one is the least important like so if you get the first two that's that could be still really strong but the third one could make it even stronger but it's not necessary is basically. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Proving that your client wasn't there. Like it, you, at that point, your case would just be acquitted. Yeah. The, so the thing is, is like with an alibi defense is clearly you don't have enough proof to a hundred percent prove he wasn't there or else he wouldn't even be going to trial in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So you're trying to create reasonable doubt. Right. Now, what kind of evidence are they going to use to create reasonable doubt? Well, eyewitnesses that claim that they saw he was somewhere else, which is, um, that drives me insane that Idaho, I, maybe it's just because it's an old code, but Idaho code only mentions witnesses. It doesn't mention any other type of evidence. Like, so I just read it for you. Eyewitnesses, that's it. That's all it mentions is like you have to provide where you were and the eyewitnesses that saw you there. Dude, eyewitnesses are so that's unreliable. what I'm saying. So why is that the one thing that's in there as the most important for an alibi? Like an eyewitness is the least important in my opinion. It's the least reliable. Yeah. Human memory is so unreliable. That's we, like something everyone's. where that's like something where you're just like marking people off a list as least suspicious when you're doing an investigation, it's like, okay, well this shopkeeper says they saw that guy there at the time of the crime. So we know pretty, pretty well it wasn't him. So check him off for now. You know, like that's like a rule tool of elimination. And then if if you can't cleared, if you can't right, if you can't solve the crime, then you go back and you examine that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I don't know. I guess Uh, it, I understand what you're saying, and I do kind of feel like Idaho does that, uh, unfortunately. But I also look at that and think like, ew, that's horrible. It is horrible. You're right. It is horrible. But that's what they do. Yeah. That is what they do. An eyewitness account should never, ever, ever be trusted. Never. No. No. Uh, whether it supports or hurts a situation or theory, no, there or should be idea. some other evidence that that contributes that supports that. They should just stop eyewitnesses unless it's like for an arrest. You, I mean, you can't stop an eyewitness. I, unless account. it's for an arrest, I don't feel like it's objective enough to be in court. Court. Yeah. 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 Uh, so other things, timestamp pictures or video footage, obviously. And I mean, that's highly questionable in this case, considering they lost footage. And Ann Taylor has footage that has the audio separated from it and is in all different separate bits and chopped up. 
Like, what are we going to see here with footage, guys? I don't know. I don't have a ton of confidence in it. What even is the point of doing that? Like, that's so ridiculous to send it in like a million different pieces and the audio and the, the video split apart from each other. Like, what? That I, If I was an attorney, I would just be like, dude, that is such a jerk move. Like, what's the point? Yeah, because like, if you're using yeah. it, I have to have it. Right. You don't have a choice but to give me the whole thing. Right. Uh, and then documentation such as credit card receipts, time cards, plane trip tickets, you know, yeah, cell phone like data. A Taco Bell receipt. Yeah. Cell phone data. Um, you know, anything from the car, if the car could record location, which not all cars can. Um, we don't think Brian Koberger's could. Not think. I know. Okay. Brennan yeah. knows that it couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, it really anything, any literally anything, uh, which, yes, that's what Ann Taylor's looking for. That's literally what's been holding this whole alibi up this whole time is that she doesn't have all the discovery. She doesn't have the cast report. She doesn't have all the footage. She doesn't have all the body cam. She doesn't have all the expert reports. She has like a pile of poop is what she has. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Really disorganized, disheveled poop. Do do. Just saying. <laughs> so one one thing that's I mean, it's very straightforward. But I figured it was interesting to go over because that's what we're going to be hearing about very, very soon. Now, the other argument in court right now is that this delay is super unfair to the victims of this crime that, you know, basically we're putting the defendant above the victims like he matters more. And one thing I will say is I care very deeply for the victims. I want justice for them. And their families. Um, I very much want that for them. And I, I, I do hold them as more important than anybody else. The, the victims' families are the most important because of what they're going through. But the thing is, is Brian's equally as important if he's innocent, the issue is we don't know. We don't know. That's why they both have rights in this situation, because any criminal case you're going into, this person has the assumption, the right to the assumption presumption of innocence. The issue is, is people are going out here and acting like he's guilty, like knowing without a doubt that he's guilty. And saying his rights essentially don't matter. The victim's rights matter more. They may matter most to me emotionally, but they don't matter more. They're equal. And that balance is something that victims have been fighting for for a long time. Like Megan's Law. Like there's been a, a ton of, and I think that passed in Idaho court, Supreme Court, like, and it went to a vote five years ago. Idaho has some decent laws around victims' rights. Yeah. And they define a victim as anybody affected by the defendant's actions. And uh, in a homicide case, the, the immediate family members of that victim um, are also considered victims. <clears throat> Now, this is old information, but you were just talking about capital cases. So I started looking up what the average length of time uh, a capital case takes. And it says here in Idaho, the average one um, from arrest to jury conclusion is like 24 months. Um, the study also noted how infrequently death penalty was applied in Idaho of the 251 defendants who were charged with first degree murder since 1998, the death penalty was sought against 22% of them and just seven were sentenced to death. More than half of the 40 people sentenced to death since 1977 have received lesser sentences after their death sentences were overturned. Whoa. Yeah. So uh, the length of time that we are currently waiting, um, it's not that far off. Two years. 
Well, it's going to be three years. Well, 2023, essentially, he was arrested December. It's of been a year. Next year, so it'll be two. 2023. So the expectation would be like at least January of 2025. And this, that would be two years. Yeah. But this, this is why I don't like covering these because this case wasn't unsub unsuspected uh, assailant case. And everything I've read on statistical probabilities around court cases, anytime you look at a, at a crime and or case that has an unsuspected uh, suspect, you don't know who the person was that did it. Everything takes so much longer, way longer. This doesn't clarify that difference. I'll look into it though. I just quickly tried to pull up the average capital uh, length of time for a capital case. And, and it said at least 24. So yeah, at least yeah. Uh, a year and um, two years. Oh, oh, at, at least, least at least two years. Yeah. And we're it essentially is two years. You're right. Because it, it, it happened at the end of 2022. 2025 January is because he was arrested on the last day of December. OK, so January 1st and then two years from that would be 2025. January 1st, 2025. Yeah. And they're going to have it in the summer. So it'll be a little over two years. Yeah. And that's um, the average capital case, not taking into account that they didn't have a suspect in the beginning. So. Okay. So this is going to trial as long as it's actually in 2025 around the time you would expect for an Idaho capital case. It is as current. Yeah. Currently. And the current a, timeline. And this is a massive four victim case dude like, you're right this is a huge case it is such a big deal because so, they don't have so good can habits. we can we so can we please stop saying they're delaying it unreasonably you guys oh, you, we he, get so many you just comments. proved it you yeah. literally just proved they're not delaying it unreasonably that no. this is the standard yeah. this is literally what happens like most times well i think it's going quicker than most times if we take into consideration that they didn't know who the suspect was and the fact that this isn't just an average capital case is a quadruple homicide um, with an insane amount of audio and video evidence, 51 not terabytes. physical evidence. Um, yeah, I think I think the expectation would probably be at least another year. And that's me being completely realistic, objective and upfront about it just because of all the issues they've had. Here. Oh my gosh, guys. Like you literally just proved it. That's the average. That's the standard. And we have so many people coming out here to mainstream media saying, why are they delaying it so long? Yeah. Capital cases yet, are hold way on, different. Hold on. At the beginning of this case, do you not remember the media saying how long it normally takes to, to try a case like this, that we would be waiting several years? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, when it's delayed, the, the script flips and they're like, why are they delaying it so unnecessarily? This is so rude and cruel to the victim's families. Just just wait Come till on. they start talking about the fact that if Brian Koberger does get found guilty, that he's not going to be held to his punishment for like another decade. Right. So, right. I don't know why you're rushing, like slow down, do it right. Make sure you're right. Because after this trial, it is only the longest amount of time before someone is held accountable. If they're held accountable, it says that, that 22%, only 22%, got the death sentence or the death sentence stuck when it was applied only 22 percent that's all crazy. the other ones got it overturned with doubt that's crazy it's crazy yep so the likelihood of him actually getting the dp is actually lower very rare 22 percent what the heck yep okay well i mean it, I, I think this great points, great points. I'm glad that you brought that up. And in addition to that, we also have, you know, the victim's rights. Like, what are their rights? Because that's what I wanted to know. I was like, everyone keeps saying victim's rights. So what are they? Um, well, or red herring. Huh? Or red herring. Or is it a red herring talking about victim's rights? Because technically, the, the, like, I understand that the families are victims of circumstance. 
They aren't the actual victims. The victims, well, unfortunately, are According past. to Idaho law, they are victims. And they have oh. victims' rights because well, they are the immediate family to the deceased. Who okay. are murdered well, by I this take it back. by the accused allegedly. That's so they are considered vic victims. Okay. Um, and their rights are that they are treated with fairness, respect, dignity, and privacy throughout the cr criminal justice process. They are permitted to be present at all proceedings, entitled to a timely disposition of the case. And that's where we get to this right here. Is this considered actually timely because it doesn't define what timely means mm. well two years which we just figured we did the math it's about two years when and this will be going to trial expires yeah oh gosh mm -hmm. and you didn't realize that no so where the the current date is the month after the two weeks expires very interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> we'll see what it happens. It takes Idaho off the hook. Oh, God. Mm. Okay. Um, so, is this a timely disposition? I would say yes, because it's happening in the average amount of time a case of this magnitude happens. And it actually seems like it's happening pretty quick for the... Because this is unprecedented magnitude, you guys. This is a huge case. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would say it's timely. So, I don't think anyone's rights are being squashed here. Um, D, given prior notification of trial court, appellate, probation, parole proceedings, and upon request to information about the sentence, incarceration, placing on probation, or release of the defendant. Okay, here's something I didn't know, you guys. Oh, wait, it's it's the next one. So heard upon request at all criminal justice proceedings. Um, that means that any sentencing, incarceration, probation, that they can literally talk at the hearing. Then F, they are afforded the opportunity to communicate with the prosecutor in a criminal offense and might be advised of any proposed, oh no, and be advised of any proposed plea agreement. That means that the pros they will know about a plea agreement if the prosecutor drafts one, that they have the right to know that. Because mm. I heard Banfield asking Steve, have you heard about any plea agreement in the works? And he said, nope, nothing. Interesting. Because they're entitled to know that. That is their right. Banfield knows what's up. She does. So if there's anybody we're going to hear about a, a plea agreement in the works from, it's going to be Steve or Christy. That's who's going to yeah. tell us. Um, which I hope they do. Um, G allowed to refuse an interview, ex parte contact or other requests by the defendant or any other person acting on behalf of the defendant, unless such request is authorized by law. Mm. H consulted by the pre-sentence investigator during the preparation of the pre-sentence report and have included in that report, a statement of the impact, which the defendant's criminal conduct had upon the victim and shall be allowed to read prior to the sentencing hearing the pre-sentence report relating to the crime. Did they get Interesting. that? Interesting. Did they get that? I don't know. They have to maintain confidentiality of that report, though, and should not disclose the contents to any person except I mean, statements made by the victim to the prosecuting attorney or the court. I would read it and then shred it or burn it. So you don't get in trouble. Yeah. I sure I mean, if I was in their shoes, but you know, Steve, Steve, I think one, one of the ways he gets through his trauma is through talking and talking about, you know, his, his daughter. Um, so I, could that be something that would be actually hard for him to keep quiet? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, that makes me because they 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 claim to not have much more information than we do. Now, it's a pre-sentencing report. So how in-depth is that? I'm not 100 percent sure how in-depth that would be, but they supposedly don't know much more than us. And in some situations, I think they've kind of proven they don't know much more than us. Um, so it makes me question, like, were they able to read that? How in-depth is that report? Like, you know? Um, okay, so I assured the expeditious return of any stolen or personal property that, you know, was taken by the law enforcement agencies when the, it's no longer needed as evidence. 
which is interesting because they never returned Kaylee's laptops or phones or anything like that. And we saw a bunch of other things return to them. So yeah, that's their right. When it's not considered evidence, it's their right to have it returned. Mm -hmm. A lot of things were considered not evidence anymore very early, you guys, which is interesting. Um, Jay, that they are notified when the defendant or suspect is released or escapes from custody. Mm. Which is interesting. And that that is one that uh, Megan's law, or was it Marcy's law? It might have been Marcy's law. Um, that's one that that put in to Idaho law. And it did many other states because that girl was murdered in California when I think it was her ex escaped. And there were no rights for a victim to be notified when their when their like abuser escaped. Oh, wow! So she, she was never notified. But now that is a law in Idaho and many other states that you have to be notified. That's your right. Good. Yeah. So that was a pretty big deal. Um, but yeah, that's that's like the basics of their rights. This is a very long document, but that's the basics. Interesting. Yeah, the the main one for me though is the timely di disposition and I I feel like that's really good information to know what the average time is um that a court case like this is normally tried in Idaho. Yeah. yeah. That's a big deal yeah. because that's been thrown around all over the place like in I feel like I don't know, I feel like it's being like really it's it's adding to the character assassination. Like he's getting special treatment. He's being allowed to delay this and violate victims' rights. He's, and All then right. also Judge Judge is getting a lot of hate. Like he's, you know, can't make a decision. Um, he can't do this. He can't do that. It could just be our character or my character being like, you know, optimistic to a fault. But no, these are I wish the facts. Are everybody facts, man. would would chill out on. Uh, on the aggression at towards people. the defense. And, I mean, no, no, no. Towards everybody. True. Everybody. Good okay. Point. Let let the decisions or let the actions of those people speak for themselves. Um, and I do believe there are certain people that we're gonna see those actions speak for themselves, like we expect them to see, but let those actions speak for themselves, not us or the community or people out there casting a character assassination on them. Because if you think Brian Koberger is innocent and there's some kind of injustice going on and you're fighting and putting down Bill Thompson and judge judge, you're doing the same thing you're complaining about. Do you know what I mean? By putting them down. Like, do I think that the case is trustworthy? No. I don't. I think there are some major mistakes here. I don't think it's a major yeah. conspiracy with all these people involved, but I think that the investigators are like, oh, shoot, we messed up. I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if Bill Thompson is part of it, like because we see prosecutors helping law enforcement all the time, just like we see the scientists helping the prosecutors that help long. Like we see it all the time. Okay. You can just go on Google and <laughs> look up, uh, you know, it, any case in any state and a lot of times you will see these questions come into play so um i don't know about any of those things i just know that we have four victims that we have to bring the attention back to and those four victims and their families deserve justice and we have a prosecutor he's the lead prosecutor doing his job bill thompson uh, whether I agree or not, you know, I'll give my opinion. It doesn't mean he is a bad or good person. We have a, a a defense attorney that was shipped in here that isn't part of this area, but they didn't have one for capital cases in this area that I think is doing her job. I have a judge that I think is doing their job. There doesn't need to be some kind of aggression or hatred towards anybody involved in this. I agree. Even if they're making decisions that we wouldn't make ourselves. You know what I mean? Like, Judge Judge is a little soft for me. I think he's very empathetic towards the victims' families. But is it against the law and wrong? No, no. No, and he I has just... to, this is his job, you guys. He has to weigh the balance of the victims' rights versus the defendants' rights and keep them in the balance. Like that is literally his job. So, mm -hmm. yes, I, I was a little thrown off guard when he was uh, very openly 
sympathetic to the victims and focusing on them, it seems, more than this case. But that's his job to take both into account. And I think that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. I actually don't think in this situation he is being a super pushover. He wants it done right. And Mm -hmm. I think the date they gave is not so outside of the bounds that it's too far of a delay because he was he wanted to get it done and even though this is not the time he wanted he wanted it sooner than this again he's weighing the balance and he's like well that's not too far out you know and the world is watching and it's not like these these people don't know that. You yeah. Guys. Like, what they if he know said, the whole world is watching? Said, and, and like, you guys, what if he set a trial date for before and could even get all the discovery? I then, know. I mean, come on. Like, she didn't have all the discovery. So what are you expecting? Yeah. Like, the people out here saying, and it just really, like, irks me. It's like, you know mm-hmm. better. So why are you saying this? Yeah, yeah. You know better Mm -hmm. you work in this industry your job is in this industry you're a lawyer a cop a prosecutor you know better you know if he sets a date before ann taylor can possibly like literally physically possible like she can't get it yeah in time he's got he, he is entitled to another trial yeah that has violated his rights the whole mm-hmm. thing is over and done with you know better yeah So why are we assisting the character assassination campaign by acting like he's getting the white glove treatment and that the judge is spineless and isn't making decisions just because they're making decisions that you don't agree with Mm -hmm. personally on a personal level, not a professional level. Yeah. Yeah. Professionally, I feel like they're doing everything exactly like they should. I agree. I agree. Everything is going according to how it should. Um, And I think I'm, believe me, I'm ready to see a trial. And I I feel for the victims. They're suffering waiting this long. They truly are. But the thing is, is it's not, it is a timely disposition if this is the average time it takes to try a court case like this. And I never understood why when people keep saying it's three years. I think that's really interesting. You just brought up it's not. It's actually two years. Because that was one thing. Is like three years is too long. Three years is too long. It's actually two and that's the average. Um, But this isn't outside of what average case would be. Yeah, this case isn't average on top of it. So I don't know. I find that all really really interesting. Um, I just ask everyone to be more objective and reasonable. And um, if you want the victims to get justice, if you care about honoring the victims, then maybe don't hop on the um, bandwagon of making everything such a big deal. That's not a big deal. Like vegan meals, which is basically peanut butter and jelly. Just saying. Yep. But anyway, I want to know what you guys think um, about all of this. What's your opinion in the comments? <laughs>